power and protests. Unrelenting unrest in Iran, nuclear threats from North Korea. We'll take you inside the stories making headlines around the world and show you how the U.S. has responded. Hear from our reporters and the White House about protests in Iran and a saber-rattling North Korea. What's next? Now, on the Inside Story, power and protests. Hi, I'm Carolyn Persuti, VOA senior Washington correspondent from the heart of VOA in its news center. Sometimes news shows present incongruent news stories, one right after the other, with no transition or reason for their order. In fact, you may have thought that about today's show, but follow me here. There's a thread that runs from Russia's months-long war on Ukraine and the weeks of protests in Iran and what seems to be daily launches of missile tests by North Korea. The thread? Nuclear weapons. Russia has them and has threatened to use them against Ukraine. North Korea is believed to have them and is thought to be using missile tests to send a message. And Iran wants them and is racing to develop them as the U.S. tries to negotiate a nuclear deal with Tehran again. Today, we'll take you through that thread and we'll weave it together to show how they all intersect. Among the many reasons why it's difficult to reach a new nuclear agreement with Iran is its current deadly crackdown on street protests. Those demonstrations started in September and have grown as Iranians seem energized and emboldened in their demands for change, despite the threat of arrest or death. In the past, Iran's security forces have crushed similar movements like this. Here's VOA's Arash Arabasadi. After nearly two months of taking to the streets and protesting their country's leadership, Iranians say security forces are now using tear gas indiscriminately in crowds and even people's homes and opening fire with live rounds. This video from Iran was posted on social media. VOA is not revealing further details about this and other video from Iran in this report due to security concerns. It started in September when Iran's morality police arrested a 22-year-old woman, Massa Amini, for what they described as immodest attire. Three days later, Amini died in a hospital while in police custody. Iran officially blamed Amini's death on a heart attack triggered by a fall, but her father, Amjad Amini, told VOA that was a lie. He says she had no pre-existing health problems before her arrest. Her death put a face on a global movement for human rights. And that's when Iranians took to the streets, chanting a popular refrain, Death to Khamenei, a reference to the country's supreme leader. Worldwide demonstrations followed, demanding human rights and calling for an end to Iran's theocratic government. Unlike previous periods of turmoil in Iran, like the summer 2009 Green Movement protesting the presidential election, the mass demonstrations following Amini's death have no leadership. Iranians say the government has now turned to jailing protesters and even the lawyers who defend them. Many of them land in Tehran's Evin prison, notorious for housing political prisoners. In October, a fire engulfed parts of the complex and onlookers reported gunshots inside. Iran says the fire was a distraction created by prisoners attempting escape. Others say prison officials started it. The Washington Post reports at least eight deaths from the blaze with at least one fire started intentionally as prisoners were locked up. Those trying to flee met guards wielding batons and firing live ammunition. VOA Persian Siamak Berampour spoke by phone with a prisoner in Iran who spent time in Evin, his voice altered to protect his identity. He refutes the Islamic Republic's claim that prisoners tried to escape, saying there is no escape from Evin. He describes heavy metal doors and long stretches of land to cover, and even if those doors came down, prisoners would have to run a long way just to reach waiting guards. And this all happened against the backdrop of the 43rd anniversary of the Iran hostage crisis. 
In 1979, after taking the staff of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran hostage, religious hardliners claimed power, burying Iran's monarchy and creating instead a theocracy. But today's young Iranians are mostly secular and inherently at odds with a government that requires women to wear hijabs, a law that led to Amini's arrest and death. Iranians say they don't know what comes next or how far the regime will escalate its response to mostly peaceful protests. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. During a campaign stop ahead of the midterm elections, President Joe Biden pledged his support to those seeking change in Iran. Don't worry, we're going to free Iran. They're going to free themselves pretty soon. That remark prompted quite a few questions about what the president actually meant by it. VOA's White House Bureau Chief Patsy Witakuswara posed those questions to National Security Council Coordinator John Kirby. The first part of that statement, don't worry, we're going to free Iran, that's not a change in policy. Did the president misspeak? The president was speaking very plainly, uh, as he has, about how much we stand in solidarity with the Iranian protesters. Is the president signaling his support for regime change in Tehran? What he was signaling was our solidarity with the protesters in, in Iran. And he's been doing that from the outset, Patsy. I mean, right from the well of the UN, made it clear that we stand in solidarity with these Iranian protesters as they try to uh, fight for their for, for basic human rights and for what a woman can wear or not wear. Uh, the Iranian leadership uh, is uh, dealing with problems of its own making. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the future of Iran should belong to the Iranian people. Uh, staying on Iran, earlier this week there was a warning of a potential attack on Saudi soil um, and the warning was that the attack is imminent within days. Is that still a credible threat? We're still watching this threat. We have to take it very, very seriously, Patsy. I don't have any additional updates for you on, the, on imminence, uh, but we uh, work collaboratively, collaboratively with our Saudi partners here on the, uh, on the intelligence collection side to, to see what the threat really is. Um, and again, we took this threat uh, seriously, as we do all threats. I mean, there are 70,000 Americans living in Saudi Arabia, a lot, thousands of troops. Uh, and we're still committed to helping Saudi Arabia with its self-defense capabilities. This is a country that comes under frequent attack from Iran-backed rebels in Yemen, the Houthis. Uh, and Iran has made no bones about the fact uh, that they're willing to continue uh, to foment the, 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 the activities of, of terrorist groups and, and, and groups like the Houthis who are willing to use violence inside Saudi Arabia. So it's a, it's, it's a legitimate, valid threat. We take it seriously and we're going to keep working with the Saudi Arabians to see what we can do to help. Protests prompted by Massa Amini's death have spread around the world, including right here, just blocks from our VOA building in Washington. And the emphasis of these protests has expanded to cover all women's rights, not just regarding the morality police, but also elections, employment, and divorce. For nearly two decades, Gita Ariane covered protests like this and the U.S.-Iran relationship as VOA Persian's State Department correspondent. I talked to her about what, if anything, is different about these protests from those of the past and how they're being perceived by the rest of the world. Mahsa Amini's death did spark the recent movement and something that now many are calling it a revolution. It's not just a movement anymore. They're calling it a revolution. There's Iran revolution hashtag on social media. And uh, it was, it began uh, after her uh, burial uh, in, in her hometown, which is a very small town uh, in a remote area. And uh, women were just, uh, had, had had it. And they could not take 
her death that was being fabricated, the cause behind her death was being fabricated by the government. And uh, they just had to, they just r came to the streets and uh, sparked this whole new movement and protests. So those protests in her hometown then grew to most of the country, right? And now they are global. It seemed to have galvanized the, the whole world behind the Iranian woman's cause, if you will. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, gradually it grew from one town to another, to another, and uh, all across Iran to major cities, um, uh, far and away and big and small. Um, after a while, uh, maybe people didn't think that this would last, but once uh, it gained momentum and it kept going, the world began to notice. It's a, all across the world, um, celebrities from the art world, from sports, men and women. So you mentioned how it's not only women, but it's also men, it's rich, it's poor. But is this group um, led by a group of younger Iranians and, and therefore more secular? This movement, these protests don't have any specific leader, a, they don't have a face, it's not just one face, it's all women in general. Um, and maybe that is why, uh, many uh, argue that that is why it's, it has not lost its momentum because it's about all women. These protests have broken age-old taboos in Iran with regard to the Islamic Republic and that has come in, in, in their slogans. The generation that's uh, demonstrating has shown it is not afraid of the regime anymore, even though they may get killed uh, by snipers or police in the area. It's, I mean, they've called uh, the Supreme Leader a dictator. They're calling him by his first name. These were taboos in Iran. Um, um, they're burning the Islamic Republic's banners uh, or, or the flag. These things had never happened, uh, you know, to this extent, at least, before. What are you hearing from Iranians about how this will end? Do they think that there will be, are they worried there will be a crackdown, as has happened in the past, or do they really believe the government will change? They are not worried about the crackdown, and they've shown it because they're still out on the streets. They are still um, holding protests. and. They say that they're going to stand to the end until this regime is toppled. Will that happen? Can that happen? It's, it's all up to them if they are able to uh, maintain this momentum. If not, make it even more, you know, stronger. It may take a while. But like I said, the slogans that they're chanting out on the streets uh, points to that uh, goal basically. Um, one chant is like, I promised my friend who died that I will um, keep this up to the end, or I will give my life to free Iran. That, that just says a lot. From the U.S. government perspective, there is a straight line that runs from Iran to Russia to North Korea. Here's more from National Security Spokesman John Kirby, again interviewed by our White House Bureau Chief, Patsy Witikuswara. At this point, what do we know about what else Iran is doing for Russia uh, beyond sending drones? Have they sent surface-to-surface -surface, uh, ballistic missiles, short-range ballistic missiles at this point? Are they still training personnel, Russian personnel in uh, Crimea? I don't have an update on uh, Iranian presence in Crimea. We know they were there to provide technical assistance and training for some of these drones that they provided the Russian military. Uh, we haven't seen any indication that they've transferred any other 
weapons or technology, for instance, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, but we're watching this as best we can. The mere fact that Iran and Russia uh, are talking about the possibility for additional capabilities, be they UAVs or, they, or, be, or, or be they missiles, just shows you how much more isolated both countries are from the rest of the international community. And it shows you how desperate Mr. Putin's becoming with his own defense industrial base, that he has to rely on outside suppliers like Iran and now potentially North Korea. South Korea said that it detected 180 North Korean military flights near its border. Uh, we know that North Korea has launched dozens of missiles, including one that landed off the coast of South Korea for the first time. This is all happening right before the president's trip to the region, are you bracing for more provocation, including the possibility of North Korea uh, attempting another nuclear test while the president and the vice president is in the region? We've said for quite some time that our, uh, North Korea could conduct a nuclear test at any time, so we're watching this as best we can. And obviously we're concerned about these provocations, uh, so many of the ones you just named over the last 24 hours uh, alone. We've also said that we're willing to sit down with Mr. Kim and the regime in Pyongyang uh, without preconditions to talk about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That's still the goal, that hasn't changed. At the same time, because he's shown no interest in doing that, quite the contrary, he's shown a lot of interest in increasing tensions on the peninsula, we have to make sure that we're militarily ready for all outcomes. As the U.S. troops on the peninsula like to say, they have to be ready to fight tonight, if need be. Now, obviously, nobody wants it to come to that, but that's why we're conducting yet another annual long-planned exercise with the South Koreans. They've extended it for an extra day. We have conducted both bilateral exercises with them as well as our Japanese allies and trilateral exercises between the three of us because we have to make sure that we're militarily ready. Um, we do see at this point that Moscow does seem to be softening its rhetoric, saying that uh, I quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. They also return to the Black Sea grain deal. Do you see this as the beginning signs of a detente and what do you credit that to? I think it's encouraging to hear that uh, the Russians uh, are, are uh, say they're not interested in uh, a nuclear exchange. Uh, we hope that they actually mean that because uh, we agree with them. A nuclear war should never be fought and it certainly can't be won. And there's no reason to escalate the tensions, the war inside Ukraine, any more than they already are. Too many Ukrainian, Ukrainian people have been killed, too many have been injured, too many have been flung from their homes and are now finding refuge in other countries outside uh, their own home country. Uh, the war needs to end. It could end today if Mr. Putin would do the right thing. Do you see uh, it as I a would, softening, though? I, I think we have to look at what's actually happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground is that the Russians continue to try to hold and occupy Ukrainian land in the Donbass and in the south. The Russians continue to flow in reservists now. They're calling up 300,000 reservists. They conducted a sham referendum to try to politically annex ground they couldn't occupy militarily and then try to put martial law in place. They're going to countries like Iran and North Korea for additional capabilities. This is, we, we're judging them by what they're doing not by what they're saying. And what they're doing is showing every indication of continuing to want to prosecute this war and kill innocent Ukrainian people. North Korea's missile tests are not deterring the U.S. and South Korea from continuing their military exercises. Instead, the exercises have been extended. VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb brings us the latest. North Korea firing an intercontinental ballistic missile a weapon designed to carry a nuclear warhead as far as North America. The test launch, along with five other missile launches Thursday, came hours before Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin hosted his South Korean counterpart at the Pentagon, prompting this strong warning. Secretary Austin and I affirmed that any nuclear attack by the DPRK, including the use of tactical nuclear weapons, is unacceptable and result in the end of Kim Jong-un regime by the overwhelming and decisive response of the alliance. The two defense leaders announced their decision to extend their large joint military drill on the peninsula beyond its Friday end date, a move North Korean leader Kim Jong-un called a terrible mistake. What they're in effect doing is showing Kim Jong-un that his strategy is failing. Uh, however, ironically, his failed strategy is also what is making him more desperate. South Korean and U.S. officials have for months warned that North Korea is in the final stages of preparations 
for what would be its seventh nuclear test since 2006, and its first since 2017. Critics of U.S. policy have said the North's nuclear provocations, coupled with the recent missile launches, could be signs that U.S. and South Korean military muscle might not stop Pyongyang from trying to attack Seoul. Secretary Austin disagrees. I believe that uh, they are deterred from attacking North Korea, uh, South Korea, excuse me. Uh, and I also believe they are deterred from employing a nuclear device. But that reassurance may not ease concerns in certain areas of Japan and South Korea, where air raid sirens warn citizens to take cover from potential incoming missiles. Carla Babb, VOA News, the Pentagon. From Russia's threat against Ukraine to North Korea's missile tests, the risk of a nuclear war has many people on edge, wondering if it could become a reality. Some are even clicking on an interactive nuke map. Others say there's no need for concern. Here's VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias. She describes them as scary, but those threats that Russia might go nuclear in Ukraine aren't yet part of Jonah Wilson's chatter with friends. No, we're probably talking about our Spotify playlists if we're not in class. Our grandparents and parents who may have grown up during the Cold War era is, I felt like the precipice of anxiety was a bit higher for that generation. Those old worries seem to be making a comeback. A vast majority of adults polled by the American Psychological Association said they fear the beginning stages of World War III. Back in March of 2022, 69% of Americans said that they were stressed that the attack on the Ukraine could lead to nuclear war. It's unclear exactly what the sense of threat is, whether individuals really think that it's going to hit the shores of the United States versus this sense of, um, you know, just catastrophic changes in the world. These days, the potential consequences of a nuke, including deaths and contamination, can be easily visualized with a click of a button. Go online, select a bomb, map the target, and detonate. The traffic in the uh, nuke map has gone up to the, essentially the highest it's ever been in 10 years. You have a lot of people uh, in the United States and in Europe in particular who are trying to find out what, what nuclear weapon use might look like. The hypothetical results are worrying, but fears about Russian President Vladimir Putin acting on his nuclear threats are overblown, says William Alberg an expert on nuclear proliferation. I don't think he would mobilize hundreds of thousands of troops at massive cost to the Russian economy and use nuclear weapons. It would be one or the other. The massive political and economic costs, in addition to military costs that Russia would incur with use, all combined to make uh, any nuclear use scenario by Russia seem very, very remote at this time. This is the painting. Melvin Hardy curated the Hiroshima Children's Drawings exhibit at the Phillips Collection Museum in Washington, D.C. Japanese kids who survived did the work two years after the first atomic strike. Some are still alive. Their scars, physical and mental, a reminder of the horror. Many of them have been affected by radiation illnesses, different kinds of cancers that they've had to, 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 to manage or mitigate. Many of them would not want to speak to us. They did not want to, to, to relive that horror. There are others who are advocates to say, never again, we must advocate against the use of nuclear weapons. But the weapons won't go away soon. In fact, Moscow's nuclear arsenal will be in full display during the drills it holds this time of the year. The United States and NATO allies say they'll monitor, quote, very closely, as a jittery world stands by. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News. Washington. That's all for now. Stay up to date with all the news at voanews.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at VOA News. Follow me on Twitter at Carolyn VOA. Catch up on past episodes at our free streaming service, VOA Plus. For all of those behind the scenes who brought you today's show, I'm Carolyn Persuti. We'll see you next week for the Inside Story.